So what's up, Internet? I don't really know how this is going to go. I don't really have a plan or a script or anything, but uh, I just thought it might be a good idea to make one of these videos. I've never made a YouTube video before. I've written a blog before that nobody ever read, I think, mainly because it was the posts were so ridiculously long. No one really felt like reading them as far as I know. But this is the first time I've ever made a YouTube video. Here it is. So I've just been uh, been thinking about a few things over the last few days. Uh, one of which is medical anthropology. I have a degree in anthropology. I made the switch over to uh, hard biological science uh, over the last year. I've been trying to get into to medical school, so I've been doing the prereqs, doing a second degree in, in biochemistry. Um, so I mean, it's it's been a little while since I've been uh, really deep in the thick of that type of thinking. That's more associated with the social sciences. Um, but, uh, yeah, medical anthropology, my big plan before I made the switch was that I would do a PhD in medical anthropology. Um, I decided I'd rather be a doctor for a bunch of reasons that I won't get to here. It's a long, boring story, so anyway. Yeah, so I've been thinking lately that there might be some sort of useful juxtaposition between medical anthropology and uh, the antinatalist movement. I mean, probably anybody that uh, searched uh, the proper you know, search fields to find this video has probably had probably has some sort of familiarity with what people call antinatalism. And I keep in mind that I uh, never, I've never actually identified explicitly as an antinatalist. But the more videos about it that I watch, the more I start to realize that this this idea that there's really no ultimately morally justifiable reason to, to reproduce and no way to really really justify it in any kind of ethical sense um, it is, is something that I've always always sort of felt anyway so I mean I suppose I could call myself an antinatalist I don't really feel a need to but I definitely understand and uh, sympathize so to speak with what they're what they're promoting so just to define my terms, I'll define antinatalism, so I'll define medical anthropology, which is people asking me, but just anthropology in general, uh, even is, once I start telling them that you know, I once considered a PhD in medical anthropology, they have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. So I'll go first with antinatalism. Uh, and I'll do my best to try to explain. So antinatalism is this idea that biological life, there's really no way no logical, rational way to think about the condition of living and being a biologically active organism uh, other than it being uh, ultimately negative, 100% negative, that it is framed by suffering, that it is framed by pain, that it is framed by vulnerability uh, to death and, and discomfort and fear and horror and all of these very nasty things that are involved with um, the universe's uh, ever-present inclination towards entropy, the, the inclination for systems to break down should uh, proper energy not be introduced to the system and utilized in a properly efficient way. Okay, so I mean, just to, to put that in simpler terms, it's the idea that that this this uh, this abstract uh, process of transition and change that we have come to call biological evolution is essentially um, it's essentially a process that is constantly carving, it's constantly carving out populations into a more energy efficient form, uh, given the parameters of their environment to include the action of other organisms. It's constantly carving out these populations using the carving knife of death and, and starvation and predation and pain and fear and all kinds of nasty uh, experiential conditions that 
a human being anyway, with uh, with all of our sophisticated intellect, has at least the capacity to understand as uh, as moral abominations, as morally perverse and ethically offensive sort of uh, conditions for any any entity, any any self-aware sentient entity to have to experience, and then even the things that we refer to as joy and pleasure and you know happiness and all the things that make life living for Allah. These are really these are what these are. I mean, they're they're generally defined by the degree to which they just alleviate these these other things, these these suffering, these various sufferings, these various vices of having to be alive. In a sense, I mean, just the, the static condition of being alive. I mean, it's, it's framed by those things. It's framed by the constant threat of these things. It's framed by the ever-present existence of these things. I mean, you think about it, you know, like a, a, a meal tastes best after a particularly long fast. You know, uh, coolness feels best after you've been down the heat all day. Warmth feels best after you've been particularly cold. You know, sex feels really good after after you've been, you know, celibate for a, a given period of time. So, I mean, these things are called joy and happiness that a lot of people will argue, well, well, life is positive because you have these other things. These things, what they are, they're just alleviations of the shit. They're just alleviations of the bullshit that really, really frames life more than, than anything else. Okay. So, I mean, that's essentially the idea that there's really nothing, something positive, something particularly enjoyable or, or really even moral about being alive. This is a forced march. This is a forced march of um, individual organisms and populations of, of organisms competing with one another for a finite amount of resources and developing all sorts of weapons and adaptations and and, uh, and instrumentation for winning that competition at the expense of other organisms. And usually what that expense means is abject horror, starvation, predation, being ripped apart, being, being consumed as food, or not being able to consume any food and, and just, just starving to death. And you know, I mean, that, that, that march has been going on for about three, three and a half billion years, give or take. And it's been sentient, in other words, you know, what, uh, what some might call bleeding and screaming for the last 600 million years, at least. Right, so you have the world, it's this big giant slaughterhouse. Um, organisms that live within this world are constantly battling to um, stave off the, uh, the threat of entropy and death, and they're developing all sorts of uh, abstract experiences like fear and pain and, and all these other various sufferings in order to, to do that. And the more sophisticated intellectually and biologically um, an organism gets, the, the wider the spectrum of that suffering becomes, for instance, a dog with all of its uh, all of its social inclinations, all of the ways it socially interacts with other members of its group, you know, comparable to some extent to the way humans do, probably has a wider array of sufferings that it can experience than you know maybe a ladybug, for instance. Not that a ladybug can't suffer. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that, but a dog, a dog has a certain psychosocial experience that offers. Um, uh, the potential for, for a form of suffering in LA, but might not. And when we consider how many of these rather sophisticated consciousnesses have existed throughout time, throughout the history of our planet, you know, in, I mean, I guess, I mean, a relatively insignificant amount of time if we're, if we're speaking geologically, but I mean, just the sheer amount of consciousnesses that have had this experience, when we consider that, I mean, the horror of it is, it's, it's really, it's unfathomable. It's, it's something that we can't really properly comprehend or wrap our brain around, and most people prefer not to think about it. I mean, this is a really depressing way to look at the world, isn't it? Well, I mean, uh, you 
have any respect for for philosophy. I mean, just because something is uncomfortable doesn't mean it's it's untrue. I and mean, philosophy is generally it's, it's a vehicle for attempting to accurately describe the reality of our circumstances. And if the reality of our circumstances really are just that depressing, I mean, it becomes a certain ethical imperative for us to pay attention to it. And most people, I really think they don't have any interest in going down that road. So anyway, that's my best explanation of antinatalism. I mean, that's essentially, I mean, this is the, the backdrop of what is. I mean, then it moves into what should be, or, I mean, what shouldn't be, uh, as it were. So, I mean, what shouldn't be is that you shouldn't be pumping out new consciousnesses into this reality. You shouldn't be out there replicating yourself for no other reason than the actualization of your your stupid, megamaniacal ego that wants to achieve some sense of biological immortality dropping a little genetic version of yourself in the world that's going to survive your death. And so, yay, I get to live forever. You know, which isn't true at all. It's just, it's true in the, this, this really, you know, easily, easily detectable, you know, symbolic sense, you know. <laughs> you know doesn't bear any, any truth in the material reality we actually live in. You know, you might feel like you're going to live forever. You're not. You're going to fucking die. And that kid is just going to go through all the same experiences that, that you do. But pro I mean, potentially. Potentially. I mean, you don't really know what experience your kid is going to have. I mean, you, if, even at the far end of the socioeconomic scale, I mean, you could be Donald Trump and be able to give your kid everything else. You still have absolutely no idea what might happen to that person. And more importantly, you have no idea idea what that person would want or whether or not they will even enjoy being alive. You don't really know what their what their brain chemistry is going to be. You have no idea what the, the, the what deformities they might be born with or what uh, behavioral abnormalities they might bear during the course of their life. You have absolutely no idea. This is a complete gamble. And you're doing it with somebody else's life for uh, a stupid purpose. A stupid, stupid purpose for pumping out one more person that that represents your own sense of self validation in the world. That's really this projection of yourself that that represents your a full membership in society and your full maturity as a you know, grown up individual, full adult, blah blah blah. And you're doing it at the potential expense of really just a, a horrible set of experiences that another person is going to have to uh, experience. So antinatalism, the central doctrine essentially, I'm not, I don't, don't, don't curse me out in the comments, I'm not saying that uh, antinatalism is some sort of cult or religion. So, and, and by the way, I mean, and from what I've seen, antinatalism, it gets uh, caricature pretty harshly sometimes it gets misrepresented all the time and i apologize if i'm misrepresenting in any way shape or form but i mean a lot of times it gets described as some sort of suicide cold or even worse homicide cold and i'm not going to say that there are people that probably would murder every living thing on the planet as some um, set of some philosophical principle if they have the opportunity i'm not saying that at all but i don't i don't believe that that necessarily represents everyone that would identify with this sort of title. So, um, yeah, the central, well, the central tenet, for lack of a better word, of um, the antinatalist position is that you don't have the right to subject another sentient uh, individual to these shit, you know, just fucked up circumstances that we have created for ourselves in you know, on Earth. And that, I mean, to a certain extent, already existed before our species even evolved, which is this, uh, this constantly degrading sense of order to the uh, physical systems that we call biological organisms. You know? I mean, this uh, it's 
part of this sends the grid to the border that has located the at a very, very, very basic sense. I mean, this is obviously oversimplification, but that has motivated the development of all of these these um, socio-political structures, um, and I mean, really the whole of our, our history as a species that now just, I mean, just horribly stratifies us and places us into these imaginary categories of ethnicity and nationality and economic class and uh, and and bloodline and you know all the rest of it i mean our experience and a lot of the the horror that can go along with our experience is uh, it's inseparably bound up with the dictates of those lines of those of, of nepotism and racism and nationalism more than it is you know with any other sort of high-minded ideal or any no, not other because I mean, racism and, and nationalism and nepotism certainly are not high-minded at all but uh, yeah yeah so i mean there's plenty of uh arguments against it to go around i won't address them them all i mean one of the one of the ones I find most annoying is essentially just the the, the old cliche is odd fallacy is this idea. Well, well we, if we weren't supposed to reproduce, we wouldn't have all this biological machinery to do so, and that's just all the bullshit. I mean, it's bullshit of of Epic Thomas Aquinas great chain being proportions. So just because you have reproductive systems in order to to reproduce them, you should just because I have a hand. That will make fists. I mean, I have a right to punch in the face with it. Okay. We have we have a sophisticated brain that can conjure all sorts of ideas and arrangements of the world. Some of which are you know, nicer or uglier than others. You know, because we have that ability, does not legitimate does not legitimize every single idea that could possibly come from that biological organ that biological organ that we have contained inside our skull all right so just because we can reproduce it means that it's just complete babbling bullshit the fact that nature wants us to re nature doesn't want us to do anything nature doesn't want anything it's a, if the, the only i mean the most conscious representation of nature is us it's us so i mean I mean, uh, there's no uh, there's no intelligence standing in the background of us wanting us to do anything and giving us machinery in order to do it. It's just nonsense that is conjured up as an excuse and a, uh, a rationalization of what people just want to do anyway for these really just just stupid, pointless egotistical sorts of reasons so anyway that's that's anatalism my best definition of it medical anthropology uh, i probably can explain this with a little more eloquence because i was sort of obsessed with it for a while medical anthropology is a by the way, anthropology is the study of human beings it comes from the greek anthropos which literally means study of humanity, study of man. Medical anthropology is looking at human experience, the study of human experience, uh, through the lens of, of how biological experience interacts with uh, a society's um, economic environment and the socio-political trends that have occurred throughout history in order to produce that environment. So it takes it it, it looks at, at the, the place, the nexus, where biological reality, um sociopolitical arrangement, um history and uh, economic environment all meet to create uh, an abstract human experience. And it's it uh, holds up um experience of the flesh as essentially 
the, uh, the focal point of, of all of the as as both input and output for all of these different um, streams of, of uh, these different streams of of, of stimuli of data of of, um, of cause and effect so to speak so I mean uh, perfect example a really classic example of uh, the way this works out in the real world is uh, Nancy Shepard Hughes, one of my favorite still living uh, anthropologists. She did a study of, excuse me, and she did a study of northeastern uh, Brazil, which she uh, she called the uh, I mean the area that she she studied. Um, she called the Alto Cruzeiro, and I mean this is area around eighty percent of all of our, our sucrose, our sugar. Comes in this area if you didn't if you didn't know that, and uh, basically what she studied was uh, sugarcane plantation workers, uh, and she went because she goes through the whole history of how um, how these people's uh, land generationally were essentially taken away from them by uh, the Brazilian, Brazilian government during the fifties, mostly at the behest of uh, Western corporations that were. Uh, that were looking to buy uh, cheap sugar from uh, newly um, independent and you know, decolonized countries, everything that we now refer to as a third world country, formally colonized areas. But anyway, the historical progression has, has left uh, most of the people in these areas completely landless. And uh, living in Shantytown, these just 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 wretched, just disgusting, disease-riddled shanty towns that surround sugar plantations and uh, you know other cash crop plantations, but mostly mostly sugar. And uh, the I mean the poverty and I mean I mean the uh, the slave wages and the scarcity of resources have gotten to a point. Where this practice has sort of evolved, and not everywhere, not everywhere in Brazil. I, mean, I don't want to, I want to overstate my case, but the practice that Nancy Shepard Hughes uh, observed was that um, when women were developing the system, they were, they were implementing this system for deciding whether or not a baby, a particular baby, uh, one of their babies was worthy of receiving uh, resources because it's certainly I mean, I know it seems counterintuitive but the poorer you are the more it's uh, an economically uh, sound plan it's more strategic it sort of is to have multiple children the more uh, psychologically appealing it can be because children represent prestige and and just in some cases, just a tactic not to not to be lonely in your in your life for somebody to take care of you once you get old. You know, blah blah blah. I don't want to digress you forward to that. But anyway, this system was essentially a, a set of criteria for looking at a, at a child and deciding whether or not they were active or passive acting. And if they were more on the passive side, people would come to rationalize them as being selected by Jesus for death to become an angel baby that would welcome you to the gates of heaven and have you die, blah, blah, blah. So what they would do is they would essentially just set them aside in the corner of the house and place like a house plant and let them starve to death and not give them any food. And the name of the book that she wrote is called Death Without Weeping because what happens is these there's no emotional um, uh, attachment to that point. There's no emotional display. There's, I mean, there's, there's no emotion is the point as far as Shepard Hughes was able to tell. Uh, these, uh, these, these women would just let their baby die and then they would be put into a tiny little coffin and little girls carry the coffin down to the, to the graveyard singing songs and this is just how they grow up and this is, uh, this is just the way things are done. And so medical anthropology, what's, what's what medical anthropology says is that the biological experience that is produced by these set of 
historically motivated economic circumstances has created a set of psychological and sociocultural um, methods for rationalizing another derivative biological experience. And that that biological experience further motivates the economic and sociopolitical environment, um, if only in that it helps to reinforce its perpetuation. Okay. So, I mean, essentially, I mean, what a lot of medical anthropology, I won't say all, but medical anthropology looks at a lot of things that don't necessarily fall under the category of terrible and horrifying, but a great deal of it does. It's a uh, um, great deal of it does deal with with suffering and poverty and disease and um, really terrible, terrible things that people biologically have to deal with and so socially and psychologically have to deal with and uh, you know, subsequently have to culturally deal with and develop sometimes you know, to the extent of, of, of the institution. They have to actually develop institutions for proper rationalization and processing of these experiences because they are so deeply bound to the economic reality that they seem almost immutable and and therefore natural, right? And you know, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, overlap between this and other types of uh, anthropological theory. Um, Mary Douglas, for instance, Mary Douglas was not a, a medical um, anthropologist; she was more of a symbolic anthropologist, but she did a lot of work on uh, symbolic rationalizations of, of, of the body, of the substances of the body. She wrote a book called uh, Purity and Danger, and she talks about how uh, what we refer to as clean, what we refer to as dirty, are really just codifications of order and disorder. And she makes this argument that, uh, that the body, your own inalienable flesh, is really the um, it's the set of symbols that you can never get away from. It's the most it's the first set of symbols you're ever exposed to. It's it might as well be the entire universe as far as you're concerned because it sets this template for how you will come to rationalize everything else out in the universe, everything else in the world. However you view your own body, whatever uh, tacit symbols for the way you um, arrange the rationalization of your own flesh. Um, what the argument is is that they become involved in the way that you rationalize the flesh of other people, other people's bodies, and so that comes to inform the way that you understand and rationalize relationships between those other people, and relationships between you and them, and relationships between them and the physical environment, relationships between you and the physical environment, blah blah blah, so on and so forth, and so your own body becomes the core of this uh, this world that kind of radiates outward from whatever symbolic attachments you're you know, putting on your own flesh. You know? So anyway, that, those are my those are the my best explanations of the two um, the two schools of thought that. Um, uh, I've been thinking about it the last few days, and I've just been thinking that that medical anthropology might represent some sort of usefulness, some sort of use to antinatalism, just in the fact that antinatalism is sort of predicated on this idea that human beings are constantly suffering all biological life that's so tangent and has a nervous system and the ability to rationalize to some degree or another uh, is constantly suffering and constantly vulnerable to the uh, to the threat of suffering, and this is a this is a, uh, an ethically offensive uh, condition that we've all been thrown into, that we've all been stuck in. And, I mean, to very degree. I mean, just the fact that I'm able to make this video and that you're able to watch this as we're on the the higher end of things, and even still think about all the things that could potentially happen to you. You know, 
um, think about all those things, and then think about someone that lives in the, you know, the northern Kivu in the eastern Congo, or you know, uh, or lives in, in North Korea, for instance. You know, all those things that could possibly happen to you, times them by uh, you know, 10,000, 10 million, and you'll understand what the life of one of these other people is. You won't really understand, but it's at least, you know, it's at least a template for for attempting to. So, um, in any case, the reason that I think, <clears throat> yeah, I've already kind of started down that road. So, because the nihilism is sort of all about uh, talking about suffering, of human beings and how this is this is not um, a desirable or positive condition. I think it makes sense that it should be it should be uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way I, I can really put this. It kind of makes sense that it should be accompanied by an academic discipline that really makes its business to get down into the nitty gritty details of what leads human beings to to, to suffer and what the, the socio-political and environmental and, and psychological and, uh, and cultural ramifications of that are. And what, uh, how all, all those things come to sort of cyclically reinforce or alter or you know, motivate uh, the suffering in the first place. You know, uh, anthropology, um, people don't probably disagree with me on this, but the way I see anthropology, is really, I mean, it's the way I see any other, any other, uh, any other discipline that attempts to accurately describe the reality of our circumstances or just simply the circumstances of the universe. And that is, it's, it, it's, it, it's just trying to do that. It's not necessarily making an assertion about what should be. It's only making an assertion about what is. This is the way it is. Here is our evidence to legitimize what we're saying about the way it is. Something like animalism from the, uh, um, on the other hand, says this is the way it is, and then this is the way it should be because of the way we're saying it is. Uh, so I mean, something that that is constantly investigating uh, the uh, the the wide wide spectrum of how human beings. Anyway, I mean, anthropology doesn't really bother itself too much with non-human animals, but uh, the way human beings are suffering, the reasons why they're suffering, the, the, the ways that they deal with suffering, whether they rationalize it, um, the, the detailed experience of that suffering, and the larger ramifications and consequences of that suffering. So an academic discipline that so involves itself with, um, with this sort of experience and, uh, and sort of uh, set of conditions seems like probably one of the most appropriate um, schools of thought to accompany the this is the way it is side of a philosophy that holds that life is ultimately negative because of the problem of suffering and our complete, I won't say ability, our complete unwillingness to do anything I mean, for the exception of a few individuals that really don't make much impact in comparison to just the endless onslaught of just selfish, disgusting, consumptive greed and exploitation and, and violence and brutality and all the rest of it that, <coughs> that produces the means for people like me, I mean, I'm uh, involved myself in this too for the time being. People like me and people like you to actualize our ridiculous egos and uh, have an iPhone and have a computer that we can make YouTube videos on and play video games and drive a nice car and have 
clothes and these are I mean these are these are the products of of slavery and economic devastation, environmental devastation, war and puppet regimes and all sorts of neocolonial nonsense that has been that I mean really has been going on since we've become sedentary economically stratified uh, animals, but has been going on in, in the specific form that we know since um, since at least the beginning of, of what we call colonization, um, and arguably um, it is a tradition that dates back almost 500 years. You know, I mean, I mean the Jeff Hughes example, I mean, that's, that's very much an example of what you would call neocolonization. I don't think it's too far into that. I mean, maybe I'll make a video about neocolonization at some point. But, I mean, essentially what this is, is, I mean, since the liberation of all of these, these colonized countries that, that were, listen, you know, and I use the word liberation quite loosely, since the liberation of these of these countries you know, since the end of World War II, namely because we didn't have the money, and I say we as the West, Western countries, did not have the money any longer to directly militarily occupy these countries, shove a gun in someone's face and say, you will mine these resources, you will grow these resources, you will tap rubber trees for these resources. And so colonization had to end. Since the, the liberation of these countries, we've had uh, a set of economic maneuverings be set up a, a, a systematic method of Western countries being able to economically suppress all these various populations and create an exploitable pool of starvation and desperation that can then be used and utilized in the form of cheap labor. Because when you're starving to death, when you have AIDS, when you have tuberculosis, when your children are dying in front of you from malnutrition, you you thank whatever God you believe in for 10 cents an hour to go work at a factory. And really, I mean, this is, this is the lifeblood, this is the fuel of our society. This is the world you live in. This is not, this is not some sad, example of of suffering that just goes on in another world that you'll never see this is in your world it's absolutely a part of everything that you experience day to day because your entire your entire life is essentially defined by your material culture everything that you physically interact with all this technology and all this nonsense all this bullshit that comes from malaysia and and uh and china and in South America, and is uh, just busting with raw resources, minerals that were probably mined in Africa at uh, that were probably mined at at best at best by some horribly starving person for for cents an hour, and at worst by a legitimate slave, just, just a slave. Not a metaphorical slave, not a way of slave, not just a fucking slave that had an AK-47 shoved in his face and was told to go into some considerate mine to get to, to get the tin ore for your cell phone and my cell phone. So anyway, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about, and I guess what I have talked about in the last 40 minutes, I guess I'll pose this, otherwise it just seems like a waste of time. Uh, is that I think medical anthropology has a lot to offer antinatalism. I think people that identify explicitly as antinatalists uh, would be well served to develop a healthy interest in reading some of the foundational literature. Things like Paul Farmer, uh, Nancy Shepard Hughes. Um, again, Mary Douglas is not a medical anthropologist, but, uh, but I think she has a lot to offer. Uh, to medical anthropology, and she does. And in the same way, I think she probably has a bit to offer uh, to the background theory and explanation of what people call antinatalism. So that's my spiel. 
I don't really have anything else to say. So I'm going to say goodbye now, say night, and I'm going to go uh, tackle my mountain of, of zoology homework. Anyway, you all have a good night. Thanks for sitting all the way through this, if that's what you did. And uh, yeah, see you later.